Somewhere in America, at this very moment, at least one SWAT team is risking serious injury and facing death. SWAT officer handles all of the uh, most dangerous situations. When the situation escalates beyond the point where patrol officers can create a peaceful resolution, the call for the SWAT team goes out. This is not just a job for them, this is a calling. Their skill, training, and teamwork allow them to end 90% of all incidents without firing a shot. And yet, the danger is always present. In Texas in the last year, we've lost four SWAT officers. We were four SWAT officers shot this last year, killed. Those are rare for Texas. Prior to that, it was 1993. In the end, their mission is the same as every other police officers in America, to protect and serve. The success, you know, without signing pride is that everybody goes home, no one gets hurt. The body of knowledge that allows SWAT teams to succeed has been built up over the years, paid for with blood, sweat, and countless hours of training and call-outs. We've got this incredible knowledge base of fundamentally 30 years of responding to hostage barricade situations, active shooters, uh, high-risk warrants, so on and so forth. And so we have a body of knowledge that we can apply. Today, SWAT teams are an integral part of law enforcement all across America. But when the Los Angeles Police Department created the first SWAT team in 1967, it was not unilaterally welcomed. Uh, let me tell you, I was almost disowned in that department because uh, people laughed at it, ridiculed it, said this is not local law enforcement. Throughout the 60s, the cauldron of American political consciousness helped create a deeply divided society. Groups like the Black Panthers, the Weather Underground, and the Symbionese Liberation Army placed severe strains on the law enforcement community with their often violent acts. Law enforcement was running around at that time, me being one of them, with a 38 revolver, and not a clue. We were being confronted with three and four and five terrorists. And as we began to get undercover officers inside them, we be it became apparent that we were woefully inadequate. Adding to social unrest at the time were the 1965 Watts riots. The Los Angeles Police Department sent so many officers to deal with the urban unrest that the LAPD became essentially immobilized. When officers were brought in from various parts of the city to respond to the Watts riot, adding more and more and more to the equation, actually became counterproductive. Too many LAPD officers at the scene of the riot caused confusion and chaos. There was no procedure in place to deal with the enormous influx of manpower. At the same time, individual acts of extreme violence occurred in a way in which they never had before. On August 1st, 1966, a heavily armed Charles Whitman climbed the tower at the University of Texas and started shooting. The siege took only about a half an hour in length, but during that time he had shot and killed several people. He had wounded several others, and he basically tied up the whole Austin Police Department in so doing. These incidents encouraged law enforcement leaders to rethink their approach to these new and deadly situations. We realized that we were just ill-equipped to deal with these very special situations. Within the hierarchy of the Los Angeles Police Department, the discussions to develop new strategies to deal with the changing realities were spearheaded by one of the LAPD's rising stars, the future chief, Daryl Gates. The key guy, in my opinion, was Daryl Gates because he had the influence in the upper management part of the department to be able to, to bring it off. And uh, so Gates is looked at by LAPD SWAT as kind of the father of their SWAT team, and rightly so. Beginning in 1967, Gates was able to push through the creation of a tactical team within the LAPD. Their equipment was scavenged from items confiscated by police officers 
and reconditioned by the LAPD's armorer. Their first vehicle was a retrofitted bread delivery truck. And then we came up with, uh, with the acronym SWAT. And initially, uh, we came up with special weapons attack teams. I took that to my boss, and he just shook his head and said, no way. So we went back and came up with a different acronym, special weapons and, and tactics, uh, because that's what it really is. The officers were all drawn from within LAPD. They were assembled into 15 four-man teams. The first group of men that were brought into SWAT had just come back from the war. Come back from the Vietnam War, some had been in the Korean War. And their forte was military operations, special operations type work and maneuvers. We looked at the tactics that the military used and were grounded in, and some of those tactics did not apply to domestic law enforcement. So we started making subtle changes. Acceptance of a new unit did not come easily. It was uh, a bit of a controversial component of law enforcement because the notion that law enforcement uh, is supposed to be a bunch of civilians who are policing other civilians in the United States is a very, very powerful tradition. But it wasn't long before the SWAT concept was put to a severe test. In December 1969, the Black Panthers created a barricaded building in Los Angeles where they were conducting illegal activities. The local LAPD captain went to talk to them. They put a 45 to his head and forced him out. Well, that's an ADW. It's all with a deadly weapon, and uh, you're not going to do that to a police officer, not an LAPD police officer, not to a captain. It's not going to do that. Warrants were issued for possession of stolen weapons and explosives in addition to the charge of assault with a deadly weapon. The decision was made to bring in the new SWAT team to serve the warrants. And it uh, made me feel very, very good because suddenly some of the people who had been critical of me and SWAT suddenly said, maybe we ought to use SWAT on this one. <laughs> Utilizing a technique that became known as dynamic entry, SWAT officers attempted to use the early morning hour to surprise the Panthers with overwhelming force. Well, that failed. And in the first 30 seconds, three officers were shot and down and drug out of the doorway of the front of the Black Panther Party headquarters and a five and a half hour gunfight ensued. The field commander called for heavier artillery from the military to end the Panther siege. Gates, who was acting chief that day, secured permission from the mayor and the White House. And then... I told the field command, I said, one more time, ask them to surrender. One more time. And tell them if they don't, the consequences are going to be extremely serious. Just one more time. So we did. And I'll never forget the guy coming out with a little white flag and waving the flag. And I thought, oh, thank God we don't have to use that weapon. In the aftermath of the successful use of the SWAT concept, the process of post-incident critiques became a vital, embedded aspect of the operation of all SWAT units everywhere. We're only successful because we critique ourselves after each and every call-up or every incident we're involved in. And we have to be honest with ourselves, and if we're not, then you're never going to improve. One of the major results of the critique following the Black Panther incident was the creation of a permanent SWAT team housed inside the Metro Division. It wasn't now a membership scattered all over the police department. It became a unit under one roof, and that's when the real formal training and the opportunity to make it better occurred. SWAT's mission was clear deal with these unique new situations where the level of risk had risen dramatically. Heavily armed terrorists and criminals, hostage situations, barricaded suspects, and the serving of high-risk warrants. SWAT training focused on concerted, aggressive, coordinated responses, adapting tactics and techniques from the military. Their training and hard work was about to be put to the most severe test yet. According to a recent study, nearly 90% of police departments in cities with populations over 50,000 have paramilitary units, along with 70% of smaller communities. 
Modern Marvels will return in a moment. One of the most notorious radical groups of the 60s and 70s was the Symbionese Liberation Army, or SLA. Best known for their kidnapping of media heiress Patty Hearst, the SLA had committed other horrible crimes as well, including the murder of Oakland, California school superintendent, Dr. Marcus Foster. The Symbionese Liberation Army assassinated him with cyanide-filled bullets hollow point cyanide filled bullets as he exited the Oakland School Administration Building. After committing crimes in Northern California, the SLA went south. Their unfortunate uh, problem was they came to Los Angeles. On May 16, 1974, SLA members William and Emily Harris were nearly caught while robbing a sporting goods store in Inglewood. Police found a parking ticket in a getaway car abandoned by the Harrises. It was issued in front of a house in South Central LA, which led them to the SLA's new hiding place. The next day, May 17, 1974, SWAT, other LAPD officers, the FBI, and additional law enforcement personnel converged on the house. At 5.45 in the afternoon, using a bullhorn, SWAT announced their presence and called for those inside to come out with their hands up. Ron McCarthy was a new member of the SWAT team with 14 years on the force. A little boy about nine years old and a man about 25 or 30 exited. The little boy said, well, there's people inside and they have bullets across their chest like this. And he demonstrated with his arms. And the man said there was only an old lady in there. Who would you believe? The SWAT team took up positions and asked again for those inside to surrender and exit. After the 18th request to surrender, SWAT acted. Uh, we then fired tear gas and were met with an incredible level of full automatic weapons fire from the machine guns they had inside. We're taking automatic fire right back from this location. They're much better armed than we are. The house caught on fire. The people inside kept firing out of the house, and we tried to get them to surrender over and over again. The woman who apparently owned the home, she came staggering out. She was taken into custody, which proved to any reasonable mind that if they wanted to exit, they could have. When she showed up, we stopped firing. While the house continued to burn, the SWAT team called repeatedly for the SLA to come out and save themselves. But the automatic gunfire didn't stop. Everybody was unnerved, and you could hear your heartbeat. I can remember that. And there was a lot of noise, but I could hear my heartbeat. The battle lasted for 61 minutes. More than 3,700 rounds were fired from inside the house by the members of the SLA. In the end, six died. Among them, the reputed SLA leader, Donald DeFries, known as Sinke. Patty Hearst and the Harrises had not been in the house. After escaping capture at the sporting goods store, they hijacked several cars and ended up watching the shootout on television in a motel in Anaheim. You realized it was a huge event. You looked around and all your officers were there. None of them were, were dead. None of them were shot. It was a, a departure from the original event in 1969 because it ended right. There was a new reality in law enforcement. From Los Angeles, the epicenter of illusion of the Hollywood Dream Factory came something new and something real. SWAT had arrived. Officials across America realized the SWAT approach. Small teams, intensively trained, able to project extreme force in a controlled tactical manner was effective in the highly charged environment of the turbulent 1970s. The SWAT approach became pervasive in law enforcement. Now, according to the, the latest statistics I've been able to gather, about 1,200 of the approximately 2,000 law enforcement agencies in the year 2000 that had at least 50 sworn officers have some type of a SWAT team. Ready! Fire! As the SWAT concept spread beyond LAPD, the components of SWAT became refined. 
SWAT met a group of police officers that were formed into a full-time unit, grouped into teams, possessing heavier weapons and body armor than patrol officers. A focus on teamwork, on tactics, on a clear-cut psychological approach to solving problems, and most of all, intensive and rigorous training. You can have the organization in place, you can have the hardware in place, you can have relations with other organizations in place, but if you haven't trained, then all these other factors are just words on a piece of paper. You have to have the training to make the responses become automatic. Each year, the Texas Tactical Police Officers Association holds a SWAT competition. It's an opportunity to test their skills, judge the effectiveness of their training, and learn new tactics and techniques. Group through, engage your targets. Leave it on safety, you're in the house officer. What these officers are doing, this is called the hostage rescue. They're going to have to go up this tower, rappel down the tower, and then they'll go over a cable cross, make entry into a house, engage bad guy targets, rescue a hostage, and bring him back. It's uh, very strenuous. But what we try to do is make it strenuous so we, when you're in a real situation, physical exertion won't tire you as much. You have to make decisions under stress in a real situation. Let's do it in training now so when a real situation comes up, it'll be that much easier. Split-second timing, nonverbal communication, containment, rapid advancement from cover, are some of the tactics and techniques SWAT teams practice in training. While it's great to do well in the competition, the overall goal is to prepare for actual call-ups. To train for this event, they, they've been out on their own ranges, uh, practicing with their shooting skills, practicing with their teamwork, practicing with their physical exertion. So they're getting in shape, they're getting better uh, shooting skills, and they're getting better teamwork. So this event is just the culmination of all the training. There's some teams out here that know they have no chance of winning, but they still come out here every time just because they know that it's going to help them in the long run. They're waiting for the real moment. They hope it never comes, but if it does come, they want to be prepared for it. We're part-time. Uh, we train 16 hours a month, and uh, from there on, I'm, a, I'm an investigator full-time, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. This is our first time. It was awesome. I, we've never done something like this before. It was incredible. It, it really teaches us something about ourselves and our SWAT team, what we need to do. We learn new tactics from the rest of the guys. We're going to come back again next year and try to do better. All of the training and all of the years of SWAT activity have resulted in a track record of significant positive achievement. Professor David Klinger is collecting raw SWAT data and interpreting the results for a Department of Justice study. It's very rare that the SWAT team shoots somebody, and so that is why the term a life-saving resource is something that would be appropriately applied to SWAT. Because when SWAT comes in, it reduces the likelihood that a hostage is going to be injured. It reduces the likelihood that innocent citizens outside of the control of the hostage taken will be injured. It reduces the likelihood that police officers are going to be injured. And finally, reduces the likelihood that the suspect is going to be injured. But the type of work that SWAT teams do carries inherently greater risk than regular police work. Which raises the question, why join SWAT? What type of officer opts for the extra risk? SWAT work is a different category of police work. And the guys and gals that get into SWAT are a little bit more athletic typically, a little bit more interested in thinking about the way to resolve problems, a little bit more interested in the cat and mouse of dealing with high-risk situations. And so they are different, but remember, they come from law enforcement. In 1990, Michael Finley was a young Dallas PD officer applying for SWAT duty. And I said, Mike, why do you want to be a tactical officer? And I said, the best thing that I could, came to my mind, I said, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly bear. So, uh, and, and they looked at me for about five seconds. I thought I blew the interview, and then they started busting out laughing. They said, okay, that's what we want. I would say that it is, in fact, more dangerous. But I would also say that one of the reasons why we don't lose more SWAT officers is because they are so well-trained and because they are so well-equipped. They can go into incredibly, incredibly dangerous situations and come out on top through superior thought, superior preparation, superior tactics, superior execution of plans, and superior equipment. 
I think there's a certain pride that's part of this. I think that's a, a very major part of it. You'd like to think you're among the best when you're doing this sort of thing. It is a preferred job also because you're on the cutting edge of research. They will develop techniques and tactics in SWAT operations, which later on can be used in the patrol force. With time, with training, with the extra risk, the rewards accrue both to the SWAT team member, to all police officers, and to society at large. To prepare for the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, LAPD SWAT supervisors trained with European counterterrorism teams, including the German GSG-9, French GIGN, and British SAS. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. In the heartland of America, St. Louis County, Missouri is home to more than a million people. In 1974, the St. Louis County Sheriff's Department created a SWAT team shortly after LAPD introduced the concept. The goal of this training session is to practice securing a house held by an armed perpetrator. The St. Louis County Police Department maintains a full-time tactical unit with 20 SWAT officers under the command of Lieutenant Jeff Bader. They hold intensive training four times a year. Clear! Clear! If we address a concern during training and a person can correct their behavior or correct their technique, so to speak, and not repeat that mistake in training, there's a very good chance that in a real-life scenario they won't repeat the mistake. Everything in time. Brienne, you put your hand. All right, hold on, hold on. Mike, hold, baby. You're stepping right in front of all your cover people. You're going to get hammered, man. The St. Louis County Tactical Unit is divided up into an A team and a B team. Fire! Their tactical team deployment vehicle is a recent upgrade. When we get a chance, we're going to train with the new winch. It's a 9,000. About three times as powerful as the last one we had. One item utilized by SWAT teams everywhere is a non-lethal device called a flashbang. Hey, police! Search warrant! The noise and the light incapacitate perpetrators for only a few seconds, but often it's time enough for the situation to be brought safely under control. Tonight, when we do this drill, there may not be anybody in your zone. There may be an unarmed mannequin in your zone. If there is somebody with a gun in your zone, you're going to shoot him. When confronted with a barricaded suspect, either holding a hostage or alone, SWAT teams use both old tools, like mirrors, and new tools, like tiny video cameras, to help them find the perpetrator and end things peacefully. Come on, step out. Let me see your hand. Suspect in custody, coming out. Every SWAT team has their own approach to armaments, but all have submachine guns like the AR-15 that can fire fully automatic or semi-automatic rounds. In addition, their sidearms are sometimes modified for lighter release, allowing for more rapid firing. Their protective equipment includes Kevlar, ceramics, and other new high-tech armor to help minimize risk and maximize officer safety. The training, the teamwork, and the constant open and honest evaluation leads to confidence among tactical officers. No matter what situation I'm placed in, I'm going to come out of it. And that's always been my philosophy, uh, never to give up and always come home. And to this point, it has panned out for me. Like most tactical personnel, Officer Mullins has more than one skill. In addition to being a SWAT team sniper, She's also a helicopter pilot. I think people find it maybe a little uh, intriguing that uh, a woman can do all these things, and, and that's fine, but I can be a role model for some youngsters coming up, you know, trying to decide what they want to do with their careers and, and their lives. Hands! Hands up! Show your hands! Get your hands up now! Perhaps the most difficult decision tactical teams must make is when to wait and when to shoot. 
more than once the people will give you the justification that you would need to be within the legal guidelines for lethal force. A win for us is when everybody goes home and nobody is killed. And we try to strike that fine balance between not putting yourself in risk of death, but not taking a life when it doesn't need to be taken. One particular call-out informs that critical moment of decision-making for the St. Louis County Tactical Unit. We went to a uh, suicide in progress with an individual who was very irrational. Many times during the call-out, he stated he wanted us to kill him. He stated he was going to kill himself. He would step out onto the front yard of the residence looking for officers on containment with a gun in his hand. He would tell our negotiator, yeah, I see this guy and I'm going to shoot him. Uh, we knew from our positions and the way, where he was looking that he didn't see anybody. The team held their fire and held their positions. The standoff continued. By morning, not much had changed. The assumption on our part was that he was either very, very intoxicated or on drugs. We then breached the second door in the house and we went back to the first door that we breached and stuck a gun out the door and was pulling the trigger on the gun. Still, the team held their fire. Despite the long hours, the fatigue, and the perpetrator with a gun. In the meantime, a second entry team had worked their way through the house and using a distraction device and less lethal rounds, they were able to confront him and take him down. The coda to the incident is what makes it such a potent touchstone for the St. Louis Tactical Unit. The day after the incident, the negotiator visited the perpetrator in the hospital where he was being treated for minor cuts and bruises. He said, uh, I don't know what happened yesterday. He goes, I don't do drugs. He goes, I don't drink. I got a 40 hour a week job. I am not suicidal. I'm quite happy in life. Uh, he said, the only thing I can think of is I went to a party. And uh, the last thing I remember is not feeling well at the party and leaving. So in that instance, we had a guy who did not need to die and who had no desire to die. And we're glad we didn't take him out. It is girlfriend's apartment this guy's flipping out of there no record on her they don't have much on the guy just his nickname we don't know anything about it. i got no history no identification all right let's go ahead. this guy could be a stone cold killer right, you know? let's see. history channel cameras were given special permission to accompany the st louis county swat team as they served a high-risk warrant tonight if everything goes as planned we'll be executing a warrant for one of our drug units the target street guys basically they will turn over the execution of the warrant to the tactical unit our SWAT team all right get them open guys we'll evaluate the nature of the location the nature of the individuals in there decide on a course of action then we'll execute the warrant for our drug unit we're going to be dropped off on one particular street cut alongside the building into the courtyard we're going to need to stay right up against the wall because on the corner opposite of us on the second floor is the target's window and he's looking out at all the time. So we need to be under it. Hit the steps to the second floor where his apartment is, verify the number, and kick it in. There are several dangers in serving high-risk warrants. First and foremost is the temptation to treat the call-out as routine, as busy work. The second is the possibility that the subject is armed and prepared for confrontation. After a long day of training, fatigue must fall away, replaced by the finely tuned skills achieved through practice and experience. It's only after the incident is over that it seems routine, when the job is done and everyone is safe. We took people into custody without too much problem and uh, no resistance. That's the way we like to do it. A little bit of excitement, but not too much. The LAPD SWAT team currently handles approximately 100 barricaded suspect incidents and more than 120 high-risk warrants a year. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. Selection of SWAT team members is critical to the team's success. Not everyone possesses both the physical skills and the temperament to undertake the dangerous tasks asked of SWAT. To be considered for the LAPD SWAT team, officers must have four years on the force and one year in Metro before applying. What I'm looking for is folks that are bright, that are physically fit, 
and that work well in a team environment. We work as a team, we'll either succeed together or we will fail together. And you got to understand that. If the suspect looks out from a hiding area or from around a corner, if he makes eye contact with a scout, you better see a muzzle in addition to that. Working and training together allows them to adjust their approach to rapidly changing situations. There is no one scenario that's you know very easy, and there's one that's very difficult because there's just twists along the whole thing, and that's also the attraction of it because you kind of never know what you're going to get. One colorful incident with several tense moments threatened the Los Angeles airport for hours. We had the Rainbow Man out at a hotel by the airport some years ago. He's barricaded in his uh, hotel room uh, with a maid that he took hostage. The perpetrator, known to many in the Los Angeles area as a colorful cheerleading fan at professional sporting events, claimed he had bombs, caustic chemicals, and a gun with which to shoot down airplanes. The maid had locked herself in the bathroom and called from inside the bathroom to communicate her status. Next came careful planning and intelligence gathering. All the rooms throughout the whole hotel are the same floor plan. So we went down three floors down and determined exactly how we were going to go about doing uh, the rescue. The plan called for explosive entry through the door to the room and through the actual wall from the hall directly into the bathroom. We blew the door, went in, caught him laying on the bed with his gun at his feet, and uh, he just sitting back with his hands behind his head, just as calm as can be, and said, well, the guy didn't have to come in like that. No, he was just a nutcase. We took him into custody with no injury to him or anybody else. It was fun. You know, that's why I keep doing this, because to me it's fun. A week later, the hotel and the maid presented the LAPD SWAT team with a giant cookie as a token of their appreciation for their work. But not all perpetrators turn out to be so relaxed when confronted with the effects of their violent actions. If I had to make a list, number one would definitely be North Hollywood uh, bank robbery out in uh, 97. Branch number 384 of the Bank of America sat on Laurel Canyon Boulevard in North Hollywood. It was February 28th, 1997. That day started out just like another ordinary day. I was at the police academy ready to go on a, on a run with a couple other guys. And one of the SWAT officers, Donnie Anderson, came driving up and said that there was a robbery, bank robbery. Suspects were armed with automatic weapons and there was officers down at the scene. Anticipating possible police response, the perpetrators were heavily armed and covered from neck to toe in body armor. For over 30 minutes, they fired shots from their weapons with complete abandon. So when they exited the bank, the patrol officers were there. They challenged them verbally and immediately they were met with literally hundreds of rounds of automatic weapons fire, semi-automatic weapons fire with armor piercing rounds. Racing through rush hour traffic, SWAT team members arrived on scene some 31 minutes after the call went out. It's one of those incidents where you get on scene and it's just absolute chaos. The noise of people screaming, the noise of people going to ground and hiding, and the helicopters. And in the backdrop of all this chaos is automatic gunfire from high-powered rifles. It was obvious that time was of the essence. The sounds of gunfire continued. To hear it that loud and that consistently just boom, 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 ongoing, not stopping, it, yeah, it kind of kind of makes the hair on the back of your head stand up a little bit. As the shooting continued and patrol officers contained the perpetrators, SWAT team members got in their car and headed toward the sound of gunfire. One of them was SWAT veteran Stephen Gomez. I could see uh, a pickup truck and a small compact vehicle parked next to it. The uh, small compact had its trunk up. I could see an individual moving around and uh, as we got closer, we see uh, bullet holes in the windshield of the pickup truck. And we see that the driver in the pickup truck was trying to drive away is the suspect. He's got a ski mask on, and he's 
got an M16 uh, kind of holding at a, at a port arms position while he's trying to start the pickup truck. All the hours of training paid off, resulting in effective, near-automatic responses. I leaned out the window, turned, and then I put several rounds into the windshield to try to stop the suspect. Uh, he, he rolled out of, the, out of the pickup truck and ran to the back of that small compact car. The suspect continued to fire wildly with his heavy weapons arsenal. It was like all heck broke loose. It was auto, constant automatic fire. And I was, uh, as I was crawling across that seat, which probably only took probably two, three seconds to get out of that car, but it seemed like eternity because I could hear his firing. And the first thought in my mind was, the very, the very first thought was, I said, Lord, please look out for us. The three SWAT officers ended the robbery and shooting spree by shooting and killing the last perpetrator. Adrenaline kicks in and all those things that your body goes through, those changes when you're in that, that fight or flight syndrome, all kick in and, uh, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, everything, everything kicked in that day. Ten patrol officers had been wounded, along with six civilians, but only the perpetrators were killed. The effectiveness and the necessity of the LAPD SWAT team was proven once again. The North Hollywood shooting was what SWAT's original intent was, and that was to respond to an incident when patrol officers were doing as good a job as they possibly could, but they were not capable of ending it. And that was the real reason SWAT was formed. Like public servants everywhere, Sergeant Gomez is unwilling to accept anything other than the recognition that he performed his duty. People say, you guys are heroes. I said, no, no, we're not heroes. We were just three experienced officers with a lot of training that, that did their job that day. Now that's what confrontation and aggression in a measured and controlled and well-trained way creates it creates success on the part of the police with skills refined and honed by training and years of successful call-ups LAPD's SWAT team continues to demonstrate the value and the importance of SWAT the LAPD trains for all types of scenarios utilizing past incidents and contemplating various possibilities that may occur in the future in my mind, you, you never become an expert because as soon as you start thinking you're an expert in SWAT tactics and you know everything there is to know about tactics, something is going to bite you that you've never encountered before. So uh, you constantly have to be trying to learn new ways of doing things and constantly be trying to improve yourselves. In addition to training and experience, another vital reason for the success of the LAPD's SWAT team is the equipment they use. Many of the weapons are modified by their full-time armorer, Jim Moody. The officers are issued a primary set of weapons, pistols, rifles, shotguns. These are all the extra types of equipment they carry with them. These weapons up here are the 37 millimeter gas guns with six shots. They'll also come and they look like this for a single shot. While tear gas has been a staple of the SWAT arsenal from the beginning, in recent years, law enforcement has been able to utilize new, less lethal options, including rubber bullets, bean bags, and special crowd dispersal rounds. Another new piece of equipment is the SWAT command and control vehicle. The acquisition in the aftermath of the North Hollywood incident was in part due to the rigorous post-incident review process that's been part of LAPD SWAT since the beginning. Whenever possible, the vehicle is staffed with psychologists who aid in negotiation with suspects. But unlike many other SWAT teams, the negotiators are actual SWAT team members, not a separate group. We have 60 police officers 21 of the 60 also have a collateral duty of being a primary negotiator, a communicator. All 60 go through the negotiation training, so they have a reference as far as communicating with these folks. And we have found it to be very, very successful. When the SWAT team is not training and not on call-up, they're utilized to patrol high crime areas. There's very little downtime for SWAT team members. 
While the nature of incidents that require the SWAT team haven't changed in recent years, there are several situations that require law enforcement to think in a new way. One is when there are active shooters, as in Columbine High School. Since the April 1999 incident, SWAT teams are more prepared to take aggressive countermeasures. This is a change in tactics from the control, contain, negotiate approach to an active approach which calls for rapidly engaging lethal suspects. Columbine was a big wake-up call. But there had been other situations around the country, but those were not perceived as wake-up calls in the law enforcement community. We view the school as a sacred place of protection for our kids. And when that sacred envelope was uh, punctured, that's when we started saying, you know what, we need to get law enforcement to go and go quick and go big. Columbine was not the first of the school shootings. There had been several before. But this was the one where the static model of law enforcement response was employed and it didn't work. The new approach in these situations differs from the old. But the difficult decision remains the same. When to wait, when to go. The question I always ask myself, if there's going to be any type of tactical intervention, is why now? Why now versus 20 minutes ago or 30 minutes ago? Or why now versus 30 minutes from now, 40 minutes from now? This is a critical issue that people have to understand. That if law enforcement goes in, it could be bloody. However, the flip side is that if we sit around on our butt and wait and don't go in, then the terrorist or the person who is crazed has free reign to continue on uh, their path of murder. This new acceptance of the necessity for greater risk in times of greater danger is part of the new landscape of America in the wake of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. The law enforcement element of our society has to be equipped to respond to these things, and the only way they're going to, to keep up is through their own continuous research. And SWAT officers tend to be real good at conducting research in technology and techniques as well as tactics. Clear. And yet the dangers, some think, are growing. I would say the risk facing SWAT is indeed on the rise because it's only when you run up against the committed crooks like the guys in North Hollywood or the terrorists who are willing to die for what they believe that you can see that police are at a disadvantage and SWAT can get at a disadvantage. By definition, it becomes more dangerous. While the risks may be growing, the resolve among SWAT team members to do whatever it takes to end the problem runs deep. The people of SWAT know there can be only one outcome, and making that happen takes patience, intelligence, commitment, and courage. Sometimes there's only one way to take violent offenders into custody if they're going to resist violently, and that's with violence. It can't be done any other way. There is no magical solution, and I doubt that there ever will be. But whatever they may face, the men and women of SWAT everywhere share the same goal as other law enforcement officers, to protect and serve, no matter what the risk, no matter what the cost. Their job is to go out and save people's lives, whether they be hostages, whether they be the bad guys. And if you look at SWAT columns today, you'll find that most of them are resolved in a peaceful way. So when people remind me of we are peace officers, that's exactly what SWAT is. They are peace officers. They are bringing peace to a situation, a very violent situation.